And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Jordi Williamson. He received his PhD in 2008 from the University of Freiburg after a postdoctoral position uh, in Oxford. He moved to the Max Planck Institute in Bonn, where he was a research fellow for five years. Then he moved to the University of Sydney, where he is uh, currently director of the Mathematical Research Institute. Uh, Professor Williamson works in uh, geometric representation theory. He proved several long-standing conjectures and found striking counterexamples to several other conjectures. His work has been recognized by some of the highest honors of the profession, the Chevalier Prize of the American Mathematical Society, the Clay Research Award, a European Mathematical Society uh, Prize, as well as a New Horizons Prize in Mathematics. Uh, please welcome Professor Williamson. So, thank you very much. It's a real honor and a privilege to be able to speak to you today. I would also like to thank my collaborators. Anything original that I will talk, to, talk about today is, would have been impossible without them. And also, there's a very concrete uh, assistance that they provided, namely Uli Thiel and Daniel Jato actually helped me prepare this talk. So Uli told me about three weeks ago that my slides were extremely ugly. And he helped me fix them up, so, and Daniel also. So, what I'm talking about today is representation theory and connections to geometry. And the idea is that groups in mathematics are everywhere, but groups are nonlinear objects and are rather complicated. And so, we attempt to linearize in some way by taking, for example, actions on a space of functions. And we understand what, ha what can happen in the linear world via representation theory. And then we hope to go back to our original problem. So I need to explain briefly what a representation is. So if we imagine that we have a regular icosahedron in three space, we can view its symmetries as an abstract group. But in this particular case, these symmetries are also given by linear transformations. They're three by three matrices. And so we get a co collection of three by three matrices that satisfies the same relations as the symmetries of the icosahedron. And this is what we call a representation. And in this particular case, the representation is faithful. So this homomorphism from our group into matrices is injective. But for the theory, it's very important to consider any, any such homomorphism. And this is what we study. So just to give a concrete example, so here's these matrices, if I considered instead the symmetries of the triangle, which is the um, symmetric group S3. So why do we study representations? I'll give you two examples from pure mathematics, but there's also examples in applied mathematics and in the sciences more generally. The first one is concerning the symmetric group. So the symmetric group is one of the most basic groups that exist in mathematics. And we might ask ourselves, what are the SN sets? What sets can SN act on? What are the isomorphism classes of such sets? And the first step is, of course, to break up into a transitive action. So I can break my setup into transitive SN sets. And then these transitive SN sets are, are classified by subgroups of SN up to conjugation. But the, the problem of understanding such subgroups is incredibly difficult. So it's very close to the, under, to the question of writing down a list of all finite groups. On the other hand, if we consider the question in representation theory, so this is vector spaces with a linear action of SN rather than sets, we have this incredibly rich theory that's useful throughout the sciences. So this is the world of partitions and young tableau. A second example that's featured heavily in this congress is the theory of Galois representations. So the question of understanding varieties defined by polynomial, polynomials over the rationals is incredibly difficult and has occupied mathematicians for centuries. But 
for about 100 years, we've been started studying this passage from varieties over Q to Galois representations. So there's many such passages. The most basic is the addition law on elliptic curve. And this passage across the Galois representations is incredibly powerful. So it's crucial in the proof of Fermat's last theorem, for example. So you think about varieties over Q as being a non-linear complicated world, and you pass across to something linear, still very complicated, but tractable. So I want to now consider, just give you the basic concepts in representation theory. That, so let's consider this simple example of S3, so the symmetric group on three letters, acting via permutation of coordinates on R3. So here there's two subsets, so it's two subspaces that are obviously stable, namely this line where all the coordinates are equal, and this plane where the coordinates sum to zero. And these two spaces intersect, they have zero intersection, and so we've split up this representation into two pieces. So on the line where the coordinates are equal, S3 acts trivially, and on this plane where the coordinates sum to zero, you can choose a basis such that you get the matrices that I wrote down before for the triangle. So we've split our problem up into two pieces. So this illustrates a theme in representation theory, namely, so a representation is simple if the only invariant subspaces are the invariant subspaces that are always there, namely zero on the whole vector space. And it's semi-simple, as in this example, if we can split it up into pieces that are simple. So now we have another look at this, this same example, but in a slightly different situation. So now we consider the symmetric group S3 acting on a vector space of characteristic three. So on a finite field with three elements. And these two subspaces are still there. So this line and this plane are still invariant. But now something funny happens. So if I'm in the first subspace, I have all my coordinates equal, so lambda, lambda, lambda. And if I sum up these coordinates, I get three times lambda, which is now zero. And so this subspace before that was, uh, we, we had this direct sum, now this subspace is contained, and we get this filtration of our representation by a one-dimensional subspace, so a line, a plane, and then everything. And if we look at the subquotients, this line is still the trivial representation, and the quotient representation at the top is the trivial representation, and in the middle we get the representation given by the sign of a permutation. So this representation doesn't split into pieces, but still we regard it as made out of these building blocks. So this is an analogy that might, might be helpful. So in representation theory, kind of a general representation is like matter. And these simple representations are the elements. And semi-simple means that there's no interesting molecules somehow. All the molecules are just atoms. And so in representation theory, what we search for is a, is a classification of the atoms. So this is the kind of like the periodic table. And we search for character formulas. So this is precise information about these atoms. So for something like their mass. So we'd like to know the dimension of the irreducible representations and things like this. And I should say that a very common feature in representation theory is to isolate a representation, something like a molecule, in which you know that a particular atom occurs a particular simple representation, but you can't say precisely how it sits inside that molecule. And so it's very difficult to actually isolate this element. So I want to talk about the following topics. I, I want to briefly consider the semi-simple world, which is the world of uh, finite groups and compact Lie groups. And then I want to move to the non-semi-simple world, which is, I'll spend the most, of, most of the lecture discussing this Kajalanistic conjecture. And at the very end, I want to discuss modular representations of algebraic groups and also modular representations of symmetric groups. I should say, so on the third topic, I'll be spending the most time, and I should maybe justify why. If you, 
so the, the theory of Fourier series is intimately related to S1, the, the simplest Lie group, the, the complex numbers of norm one. And the theory of spherical harmonics, which is the analog of Fourier series for a sphere, a two-sphere, are related to the compact Lie group SO3 of Euclidean transformations of three space. And if you would like to go beyond this to non-compact Lie groups, for example, SL2R, Harishandra built this beautiful theory in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that relates this, in principle, analytic problem to an algebraic problem and to the study of infinite dimensional representations of Lie algebras. And although I won't be studying exactly the situation that Harishandra studies, it's very related, and there's many precise connections between the world that I'll be discussing and the world of representations of non-compact Lie groups. And having understood this case, it was, it's somehow very generative, so it's provided means of, for example, understanding p-adic groups and other areas of representation theory that are very important. And I just want to emphasize the following pattern that will occur again and again, which is that in representation theory, we often, often the problems are of an algebraic nature. So you would like to know the dimension of a vector space, or you would like to know which operators can satisfy certain relations, which matrices can satisfy certain relations. And so you're tempted to think that it's an algebraic subject. And yet throughout history, the deepest theorems often first have geometric proofs. And so then you're led to ask, what precisely is geometry, geometry providing in, in representation theory, in the algebraic situation? And surprisingly often, it's provided by an invariant form. So by this, I mean a symmetric bilinear form or a Hermitian form. So if you're, if you're wondering, how do I go from geometry to in, an invariant form, I'm thinking about something like an integral providing a Hilbert space structure or an intersection form in cohomology. And a related feature to th these invariant forms is what I call um, hidden semi-simplicity. So semi-simplicity is a little like the air that we breathe in representation theory. It's in the initial situations, it's everywhere. But then when you go further, further out, you lose semi-simplicity, but still you have the impression that the, the world is more semi-simple than it a priori has a right to be. So an example of that might be you might have some infinite dimensional representation, and it has some very natural filtration, and the successive subquotients of this filtration are semi-simple. That's an example of hidden semi-simplicity. And because I'll be jumping between real and complex vector spaces, I don't want to have to say symmetric form or Hermitian form, so I'll just say geometric structure. Okay, so geometric, geometric structure, for example, on a complex vector space is a Hermitian form. And if you would like another analogy for this hidden semi-simplicity, you can think about semi-simplicity as being having a definite form, and hidden semi-simplicity as knowing the signature of a form. OK, so now I want to review the semi-simple world. So the first theorem that we learn in a, in a course on finite groups is Mushka's theorem, which is that any representation of a finite group is semi-simple. And I want to review the proof because it illustrates general features in the subject. So it follows from two observations. The first one is that if our representation has a G-invariant geometric structure. So G-invariant means if I, if I take a measurement before and after acting by my group, I get the same answer. Then my representation is semi-simple. And why is this? Because if I have a, a, a stable subspace and I take the orthogonal, because my form is definite, this will give me a direct sum decomposition. And by invariance, this orthogonal will be a sub-representation. And in fact, going from here to semi-simplicity is just keeping on breaking up your representation. So if this is not, if u is not simple, then I can find a subspace and I can split it again, etc. The second observation is that any finite group, any representation of a finite group, admits a positive definite geometric structure. And here we have a beautiful averaging argument. We just take any geometric structure, positive definite, and we average 
And because we're taking a sum of positive numbers, this stays positive definite. And because we've averaged, it's G invariant. So in this, and so now the theorem follows, and in this you see two, two interesting features. So the first one is that we prove semi-simplicity via introduction of geometric structure. And the second feature is elementary, but I still find it surprising, even though the proof is very, very simple, that if I have a simple representation over the complex numbers, then this geometric structure is essentially unique, this positive definite geometric structure. So you have unicity of geometric structure. So if in this first example, if on this first slide, I'd chosen the wrong notion of geometry and my triangle was not equilateral, this would provide a way of kind of making it equilateral. So what Weil noticed is that I can integrate across a compact Lie group and provide the same argument. So if, if we consider a compact Lie group like S1 or SU2, or a finite group, then we can do this averaging procedure again. And exactly the same proof works to show that any continuous representation of a compact Lie group is semi-simple. And again, we have this feature of existence and uniqueness of geometric structure. So I would like to show you a letter from uh, Elie Carton to Hermann Weyl. This was just after Weyl proved this theorem, about a few weeks after Weyl proved the theorem. So Elie Carton was the expert on the algebraic theory of complex semi-simple Lie algebras. He had completed the classification build, building on the work of killing. And he had classified the simple representations of complex semi-simple Lie algebras, and he suspected that the semi-simplicity theorem were true, but could not prove it. And he writes to Hermann Weyl, the difficulty, I dare not say the impossibility of finding a proof which does not leave the strictly infinitesimal domain shows the necessity of not sacrificing either point of view. So I find it a beautiful quote because it, it shows uh, this difficulty of providing algebraic proofs for, for statements coming from geometry. This is one of the most important basic theorems in representation theory. And also, uh, Carton is emphasizing that both points of view are important. And in this particular example, if you've taken a first class on complex semi-simple Lie algebras, one of the theorems that one proves is that there's an algebraic proof of this sem semi-simplicity theorem using the Casimir element. And this was done about 10 years after Carton wrote this, wrote this letter. So it was rather difficult to provide a geometric proof. And just to illustrate the slide where I said that geometric proofs often come, sorry, algebraic proofs often come from some kind of invariant form, in the case of the Casimir element, it comes from something called the trace form. And so you can think about this trace form as being a relic of, of geometry. So I want to consider an extended example to go, this will kind of take us from the semi-simple world into the non-semi-simple world. So this is the example of SU2, and it's Lie algebra SL2. So we consider SU2, so this is the, it's a compact Lie group, and it consists of two by two Hermitian matrices of determinant one. And this you can imagine as being the unit quaternions, so it's a three-dimensional sphere topologically. And it's Lie algebra, so this is a three-dimensional Lie group. It's Lie algebra is a real three-dimensional Lie algebra. And we, when we complexify this Lie algebra, we get the Lie algebra of two by two traceless matrices called SL2. And here this basis will be important in a second. So when I was preparing this, um, this talk, uh, so many years ago I wrote to a friend of mine asking why they are interested in representation theory. And they didn't reply until about three days ago when I was finishing the slides, and I thought this was an amazing coincidence, so I include this quote. I don't think it's the representations themselves, but the groups. I find SU2, SL2, SN amazing and beautiful animals. If I have a favorite, it's SU2, but we'll probably never really understand them. I might someday understand their linear shadows, though. So thanks to Quindici. So SU2 acts on its uh, natural representation. So it is a Lie group of two by two matrices. And so it has a natural two-dimensional representation. And I'll call these 
the basis vectors y and x. And so now it also acts on homogeneous polynomials in y and x. So if I look at homogeneous polynomials of degree m, I get an m plus 1 dimensional representation. This representation is simple, and we've just written down all the simple representations of SU2. And this example is enormously important in quantum mechanics. And also, if we were to write down these matrices, so, th so th there's a natural action on this vector space, and so we can write down the corresponding matrices of how SU2 is acting. And what we would get is basically spherical harmonics, these beautiful functions on the two-sphere, the analog of Fourier series. But these functions are rather complicated, and so instead we would like to pass to the Lie algebra. So I was motivating representation theory as some kind of linearization procedure where you linearize the target, but if you have a Lie group, you can also linearize the source. And so we make this into an algebraic problem on, in both source and target. So now I want to describe how these, these generators E, H, and F of the Lie algebra act. So they act by very simple formulas. So in principle, I should tell you three six by six matrices, which give the action of these generators. But these generators act in a very special way. Namely, if we consider this basis of monomials, they send a monomial to a scalar multiple of a monomial or zero. And so I can just draw an arrow. So H acts diagonally with these eigenvalues. So H is a diagonal matrix. And, and these are called the weights of H, these numbers. So these are the weight spaces of H. And then E and F act as nilpotent raising and lowering operations via very simple formulas. So here, we've just written down all of the kind of atoms. And it's very simple to now exponentiate these and get an action of SU2 to go back to SU2. So, but this is a very unusual situation in representation theory that we've just written down all the atoms immediately. So by Weyl's theorem, in our universe at the moment, we just have semi-simplicity. So we just have number of non-negative integer many atoms, so, and they don't interact. But we would like to kind of avoid doing things by hand because this just becomes impossible in, in more complicated situations. And this is the theory of Verma modules. So Verma modules first arose in an attempt to provide a simple construction of these finite dimensional modules, but then people subsequently discovered that they have a fascinating internal structure. So I'll give the example of SL2, and in the next few slides, we're doing SL2 as a kind of analogy for the more complicated case of an arbitrary semi-simple Lie group or an arbitrary complex semi-simple Lie algebra. And so as vector spaces, it's just infinite dimensional in one direction. So it has a basis indexed by non-negative integers. And here's a picture of what it looks like. So again, it's given by some rather explicit formulas. Okay. So again, H is acting diagonally, and this is the weights. these are the weights. And E and F are raising and lowering in this representation. The important thing here is the blue numbers. So if all these blue numbers are non-zero, what this means is that by using these lowering and, operate, lowering and raising operators, I can move wherever I want in my representation. Okay, so if all of these blue numbers are non-zero, which is the case where lambda is not a non-negative non integer, then this Verma module is simple, so it's an atom. But if one of these blue numbers is zero, and w so this is the next slide, so if we're in this green area, see this is zero in red, we can never get out. And so this is a submodule, and this submodule is isomorphic to something that we've already seen, namely one of these simple Verma modules for the parameter minus four, and when we take a quotient, we get this simple finite dimensional module from before for SL2. Okay. So this is what happens in general. So if lambda is a non-negative integer, 
then this molecule consists of two pieces, the finite dimensional module plus another Verma module. And if lambda is not 0, 1, 2, 3, we get a simple and infinite dimensional module. So this is indicative of what happens in general. We have this single family of modules varying based on one parameter. And these modules simultaneously produce all the finite dimensional modules as quotients. We get some new infinite dimensional modules that are very important. So for example, these, um, these delta of lambda at negative integers are, are related to discrete series representations of SL2R. And the structure varies based on, in a rather subtle way, based on these parameters. So now I come to the Kajdanlisic conjecture. So we have one, so now we consider a general complex sim simple Lie algebra. Free, so SL2 was an example. And we consider a Carton subalgebra and the Vial group. So an example to bear in mind is to take n by n matrices of trace zero. So this is the special linear Lie algebra. H is the diagonal matrices. And W is the symmetric group, Sn, acting just by permuting these elements on the diagonal matrix. So in this example of SL2, H would just be the span of the element H. So H is kind of like the semi-simple part inside our Lie algebra. And some motivation from Lie theory. So we often think about this vial group as being something like the skeleton of our Lie algebra. So we're very happy if we can answer a question about the Lie algebra in terms of the vial group. So the vial group is of order of magnitude more simple. So for example, for the Lie algebra E8, we have some enormous 248 dimensional Lie algebra and the vial group is acting on a space of dimension eight. And so there's a, although the question for the vial group might still be very complicated, there's a massive simplification by passing to this skeleton. So in the case of a general complex semi-simple Lie algebra, the notion of a weight is replaced by a linear form on this Carton subalgebra. This Carton subalgebra is commutative and a character is just the same thing as a linear functional. So in the example of SL2, this weight was just identified by its value on H. So we just got a complex number. So to any such weight, we can associate a Verma module, which as for SL2 is an infinite dimensional module. And as we saw for SL2, each of these Verma modules has a unique simple quotient, and this is called a simple highest weight module. So just to go back for what we saw for SL2, if lambda is not a non-negative integer, then we get an infinite dimensional simple module. Whereas if lambda is a non-negative integer, then we get the finite dimensional module to do with spherical harmonics and kind of that shows up everywhere. So the basic problem that we're asking about is to describe the structure of these Verma modules. So the precise question that we're asking is which simple modules occur with which multiplicity. We have this molecule that's this Verma module, and we want to know what its structure is, which atoms occur with which multiplicity. And again, I'll repeat that this might look like a arbitrary problem, and it might not be clear why we're studying this, but I don't think anybody expected this problem to be as interesting and as fundamental in representation theory as it turned out to be. So these modules are named after Verma, and in the 1960s, people investigated the structure of these Verma modules, and if you do small examples like SL2 or SL3 or SP4, the simple modules that occur are predictable based on the Vial group, and the multiplicities are always one. And people suspected that this might always be the case. And then Bernstein, Gelfand, Gelfand, and Janssen found examples in the 70s, very special examples for SL4, where isolated multiplicities were two. And this was surprising. 
And then a few more examples were, were discovered, but people had very little idea of what was going on, I believe, at the time. And that was the subject of the Kajdanitsa conjecture. So here is the statement of the conjecture. On the left, we have this Verma module, which is this big com infinite dimensional thing, but it's elementary. For example, its weight spaces are well understood. And on the right, we have the simple atoms occurring inside it. And the multiplicities which with, with which they occur are given by the value at one of a polynomial called a Kajdanitsa polynomial. Now, I've written there that this began a new paradigm in representation theory, and this is not an exaggeration. So, to give you some idea of why this was such a kind of extraordinary conjecture, I want to explain something that it led to. So, in the, ba in the theory of uh, finite groups and compact Lie groups, an enormously important role is played by orthogonality of characters. So this is the fact that the basic Fourier modes are orthogonal, for example. And in this non-semi-simple world, orthogonality no longer holds. And so back in the world of compact Lie groups, for example, Weil was able to write down a dimension formula, formula and a character formula for the simple representations, essentially only using the orthogonality of characters. So it's a very powerful tool. But we lose this when we go to these non-semi-simple situations. But what this Kajdanitsa conjecture led to is this theory of canonical bases where orthogonality is replaced by some kind of almost orthogonality with an additional parameter, and that's this mysterious V there. So at the moment, it's not at all clear why there should be this... I mean, we expected numbers for these multiplicities, and what we got was the value at one of a polynomial, and why. The second point to make is about these Kajdanitsa polynomials. So these only depend on the vial group. So they satisfy this condition that they only depend on the skeleton. Okay. So now I want to show you some slides concerning Kajdanitsa polynomials. And I won't be able to describe how you calculate them, but I want to show you some slides to give you an idea. So, uh, this is just in the interests of honesty. So, uh, yeah. so th this is the expression in terms of the vial group that, that we're looking for from before. So, imagine, so what I'm drawing here is an affine vial group. So, if we were looking at, for example, the symmetries of a, of a triangle, they would be all reflecting hyperplanes that pass through a single vertex. And when we add shifts of these hyperplanes and consider reflections in the shifts of these hyperplanes, we obtain an affine vial group. And the reason I'm showing you an affine vial group is firstly because it's flat and I can draw it on the screen, and secondly because you see interesting behavior in the Kajdanitsa polynomials more quickly. So in order to show you for a vial group what Kajdanitsa polynomials were, I would have to already draw three and four and five dimensional objects. So I'll uh, go a little bit further. So this is an example of uh, a whole lot of Kajdanitsa polynomials organized by their second parameter. So each of these triangles represents an element of the affine vial group, and this Kajdanitsa polynomial depends on two parameters. And what I'm doing is fixing the second parameter and displaying all of the non-zero Kajdanitsa polynomials for the first parameter. So if we go back to here. So there's some simple algorithm which is producing these polynomials. It's simple in the set sense that if I'm here and I want to make one step, I can do so easily. But it's rather unpredictable what will occur. So it's, it's, it's somewhat like a dynamical system where the local rules are rather, rather clear and well-defined, but the global behavior of the system is very unclear. And the global behavior of these polynomials is, there's still many mysteries about them. So we go out. And so if you go back to something like this, you should imagine up to a transpose that I'm sweeping under the rug, that this is some Verma module, so some big molecule. And what we're trying to do is 
what these polynomials are telling us is how often certain simple modules are occurring inside this module. And in order to get these multiplicities, we're evaluating these polynomials at one. Another important point here is that I've only shown you a few examples, but these polynomials appear to have positive coefficients. So these polynomials are defined for a broad class of groups called Coxeter groups. And uh, when they were initially defined, people did many, many calculations, and they always got coefficients with, they always got polynomials with non-negative coefficients. OK, so this is a potted history of the Kajanitsi conjecture. So uh, it was first proved by Brilinski, Kashiwara, and Balins and Bernstein in 1980, one year after it was posed. And Kashiwara, of course, is the recipient of this, of the Chern Medal of this ICM. And there's another conjecture called the Janssen conjecture, which is very beautiful, and I would love to be able to talk about it, but somehow slides are limited. Slides and time are limited. So I'll tell you very briefly what it says. So we have this verba module, and there is a form on this verba module which defines a filtration. So every verba module comes with a canonical filtration. And the, the Janssen conjecture is saying that the subquotients in this filtration are semi-simple. So this is an instance of hidden semi-simplicity. And it also explains where this V is coming from. Namely, now we don't just ask how many times does a simple module occur in our module, but we can ask in what layer of this filtration does it occur. And so we can make a polynomial. And Janssen originally suspected that the su successive subquotients were semi-simple. And then later, uh, Gabba Joseph realized that, in fact, that implied the Kajanitsa conjecture. And what I'll be discussing for almost the rest of the talk is an algebraic proof of the Kajanitsa conjecture and the Janssen conjecture. I, I, I'll be discussing a very specific aspect of this proof. And another reason that I'm including the Janssen conjecture is that through experience, we suspect that the Janssen conjecture is a deeper statement than the Kajanitsa conjecture. And the techniques, uh, naturally, when we obtain an algebraic proof, of the Kajanitsa conjecture, it was natural to ask how strong are these techniques? Can we also use them to get the Janssen conjecture? And with some work, you can. So I won't say anything about the original geometric proofs except to say that they use an enormous variety of techniques. It's an extraordinary story. The, the conjecture was made in 1979. And a lot of the te techniques that were used in the proof, so a very important technique is the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence that was established by Kashiwara only a few years prior to this proof. It was an amazing confluence of ideas that led to this proof. So there's D modules, which is something like algebraic linear differential equations, perverse sheaves, Delin's theory of weights involved in the proof. So the algebraic proofs are much more elementary. So what they use is... The, something that I'll call shadows of Hodge theory. So this is some kind of rather elementary linear algebraic data that I'll explain in a second. And I should also say that when I was talking about the Janssen conjecture, this involves a form. And in the algebraic proofs, I'm also considering forms, but these are not at all the same forms. OK, so now I want to... go into the shadows of Hodge theory. So I want to emphasize that vial groups, so these are the reflection groups that occur as the skeleton of a complex semi-simple Lie algebra, are certain special real reflection groups. So these are real reflection groups that are crystallographic, so they stabilize a lattice inside my vector space. And these are examples of real reflection groups. And in the 30s, Coxeta wrote down a presentation of real reflection groups. And then in the 60s, Tietz had the idea of just considering groups with, defined with this presentation, no matter whether they're finite or not. And you get this very, very large class of finitely presented groups called Coxeta groups. So an example would be the symmetries of this hyperbolic 
space hyperbolic plane that I've drawn there. And the difference between vial groups and real reflection groups is not particularly great. There's a few more real reflection groups than vial groups. But the world of Coxeta groups is enormous. So it's kind of a whole spectrum of Coxeta groups beyond real reflection groups. So I first want to give a to toy model of what, I, what I'm calling shadows of Hodge theory. So we consider a real reflection group. So either of the examples from the start of the talk would be fine. Note that the first one is a vial group, the second one is not. We consider the polynomial functions on our vector space. So this will be a polynomial ring over the reals in dimension of h many variables. And we double degrees, so it's all in even degrees. And we consider the, the w invariants of positive degree. So the w invariant functions on our vector space of positive degree. And we consider this quotient. So this is a finite dimensional graded real vector space concentrated in only even degrees. And if W is a vial group, this vector space has a geometric meaning, namely it is the cohomology of the flag variety of our complex semi-simple Lie algebra. So the flag variety is a very interesting fundamental space associated to any complex semi-simple Lie algebra. So for SL2, we get the Riemann sphere P1. And for SLN, you get the variety of complete flags on a complex vector space of dimension n. So we have this space. So this is a finite dimensional vector space uh, concentrated in even degrees. And this number d. Now, this possesses something like the intersection form on cohomology. So this possess possesses a symmetric bilinear form. It's unique up to scalar with the displayed property. And this is actually a perfect pairing between, so d is the middle, middle degree, and it's a perfect pairing between something i below d and i above d. So these two vector spaces are in duality. So there exists an open cone inside the dual of our vector space. This is something, some analog of the Kähler cone. And the first uh, part of our theorem, so I'm giving the example of the co-invariant ring as a toy model of the main theorem. So the first statement is that hard left shets holds. So on the right-hand side, I've displayed an example. So here D would be 4. And so this is a graded ring. And so given any element in degree 2, I can consider multiplication by that element. And this will raise degree by 2. And what hard left shet says, it's, it's a kind of amazing non-degeneracy statement. It says that if we multiply from this elements in this cone k, we always, so from, the, from degree 0, we go all the way up to degree 8. And for degree 2, we go all the way up to degree 6. And so we have an isomorphism from the lowest degree to the highest degree that factors through all these intermediate vector spaces, for example. So before I said that we have this form which is putting things below the middle and above the middle in duality. So H2 is dual to H6. But if we choose one of these elements inside this cone, we have a way of matching H2 and H6. These are the sa this is an isomorphism. And so we can put these two things together and we get a form on each of these vector spaces. And what the Hodge-Riemann relations tell us is what the signature of this form is. So I won't give too much detail about what this statement is. It's the statement that we have a natural, naturally defined symmetric form, and we know its signature. So just to come back to the SL2 from before, in fact, the hard left shets theorem is equivalent to the statement that in fact, we have an SL2 action on this cohomology. So this theorem is identical to theorems in complex algebraic geometry. Namely, if my vial group is the vial group of a complex semi-simple Lie algebra, then this theorem follows from the hard left shets theorem and the Hodge-Riemann relations in complex geometry. However, if, for example, I took W to be the symmetries of the icosahedron, I get an extremely interesting 120-dimensional real vector space for which these, this theorem holds. Okay? And we don't know any way of deducing this from geometry. 
So I will briefly explain the connection to the uh, Kajdanitsa conjecture. So Zergel was very interested in uh, the Kajdanitsa conjecture and was interested in understanding other ways of approaching it. And he provided a way of producing out of a Lie algebra representation a very interesting vector space called HW. So this is a, this is a graded H module. And he also showed that these graded H modules have a very elementary algebraic definition. So there's some inductive definition that provides for every element of the vial group a finite dimensional graded H module. And he showed the remarkable statement that, in fact, the Kajdanitsa conjecture about the decomposition of vial modules is equivalent to a relatively innocent-looking statement about the dimension of this vector space. Namely, it's determined by Kajdanitsa combinatorics. But he could not show this equality. And if the, the way that HW is defined, it's very inductive. And also, the way that Kajdanitsa polynomials are defined are very inductive. And so you somehow have to match two inductive algorithms. He used a deep theorem in, in, in algebraic geometry known as the decomposition theorem to show that HW is, in fact, the intersection cohomology of a Schubert variety in the flag variety. And once this identification is made, you can prove the equality one and hence deduce the Kajdanitsa conjecture. Okay, so in the vial group case, you have these modules HW, and they are intersection cohomology of something. And for intersection cohomology, there's deep theorems due to Saito, uh, which give you, for example, the Hodge-Riemann relations, and also Balins and Bernstein, Deline and Gabba give you the hard Lefschetz theorem. And what we proved, independent of geometry, is that HW satisfies the hard Lefschetz theorem and the Hodge-Riemann relations. I, I just want to point out some similarities to the semi-simple world. There's some similarities in this proof to the proof of Mushka's theorem, which was given, I guess, in 1897 or something. So the first point is that this invariant form, the analog of the intersection form on cohomology, is unique up to scalar so, and satisfies the Hodge-Riemann relations. So it's kind of remarkable a remarkable fact. So if I give you a simple representation of a finite group, it has a, non it has a geometric structure, and this geometric structure is automatically positive definite. And here we have, it has an invariant form, and this invariant form automatically satisfies the Hodge-Riemann relations, giving all this signature information. The second point is that it's, the key to the proof is keep, keeping this geometric structure there the whole time in exactly the same way that you prove semi-simplicity for representations of finite groups by introducing geometric structure. Also, De Cataldo and Migliorini gave a Hodge theoretic proof of the decomposition theorem. This was this theorem used by Zergel initially to identify these HW with intersection cohomology. And we use several of their techniques in our proof. And there's also this whole world that, I'm, that I haven't talked about today of diagrammatic algebra. So there's, there's been this, uh, a small revolution in our subject in the last 15 years of using uh, diagrammatic tools to understand two categories and do calculations. And so the ability to be able to do, perform large calculations was very decisive here. So remember back to this slide where I have a, a vial groups, reflection groups and coxeta groups. And everything we do works in the context of a coxeta group. So there was this conjecture that was made about Kajdanitsyk polynomials that they have non-negative coefficients. And this conjecture was proved in the vial group case by appealing to the existence of geometric structures like Schubert varieties. But because, so our proof is done entirely analogously to the case of Schubert varieties, but we don't actually need anything from geometry, and so we obtain a, a proof of this conjecture. So these polynomials always have positive coefficients. And this is, fits into a kind of remarkable development in the last uh, 30 years in mathematics that 
in a number of different situations, Hodge theoretic structure has been found. So there's a theory of intersection cohomology of non-rational polytopes, which is related to very concrete questions about polytopes, about face numbers of polytopes. And if your polytope happens to be rational, so it has rational vertices, you can identify so this polytope gives you a toric variety, and you can apply geometric tools to this toric variety. But it turns out that you can still get the vector space even when the toric variety is missing. And there's been this very interesting recent work of Aprizatu, Hu, and Han Katz. So Juni Ha gave a beautiful talk on Monday about this subject, uh, where they use this Hodge theoretic structure to prove long-standing conjectures in, in matroid theory. And so I think it's an incredibly interesting question to what extent... So all of these theories so far have some intersection with the locus of geometry. And is this an accident? Is there some way of deducing these, these properties from geometry that we haven't found yet? Or is it the fact that we haven't been looking for this structure enough, and in fact it's everywhere? So I think it could go either way, and I think that this is an incredibly interesting question. So at the end of my talk, I would like to talk about modular representations. So this is representations of groups in characteristic P, just like at the very beginning of the talk when I considered this action of S3 on a three-dimensional vector space in characteristic 3. So there are very strong analogies between the Kajan-Lutzer conjecture and modular representations of reductive algebraic groups. And the precise analogy is given by the uh, Lustig conjecture. And the techniques that uh, were introduced by Zergel are very useful in understanding this setting. However, now we do not have things like, we do not have signature to make the proofs work. And so there's no a priori reason why these statements should hold. And in fact, it's been a fascinating topic over the last 20 years to decide exactly when these statements hold. And I just want to emphasize that invariant forms n still play a key role. So now they're over the integers. So now we have some invariant form, and we might, for example, know its signature when you tensor with R, but we're interested in, for example, its determinant. And these determinants are extremely difficult to calculate. So the Lustig conjecture from 1980, so this is a conjecture about the representations of reductive algebraic groups in characteristic P. And in the case of algebraic groups in characteristic P, it's not as easy to go between group and Lie algebra as in characteristic zero. But in fact, for simple modules, you can still do this. And what I've written down there is actually a statement about representations of the Lie algebra. So on the left-hand side, you have something called a baby Verma module, which is a finite dimensional version of a Verma module that only exists in characteristic P and has an incredibly intricate structure. And on the right, you have uh, simple modules. And as with the kajan lutzer conjecture, this would determine character formulas for this simple module. So and an important point is that the vial group in the kajan lutzer conjecture gets replaced by the affine vial group. So this, the fact of, a, of operating in characteristic P introduces this affine vial group. So for large P, this Lustig conjecture is known to be true. So uh, an enormous amount of work uh, culminated in the fact that for any given root system, for example, for a group like SL8, we can say that from a specific bound, the Lustig conjecture holds. But initially, the bound was hoped to be, for example, for SL8, it was hoped to be 8. So as soon as your prime is larger than 8, it was hoped that the uh, Lustig conjecture holds. And this work culminated in knowing that it's true as long as P has 100 digits or more. So there's kind of an enormous gap in what was expected and what's provable. And in 2013, I showed, based on, uh, based on a formula I discovered with Xu uh, Hu, that it's actually false for primes growing exponentially in the rank. Uh, 
So for example, for SL100, it's false for a prime of order 470 million, okay? against the hope that it, was, that it was true for primes bigger than 100. So what we need is a, is a kind of new, we need new formulas that are actually applicable for primes that you might care about. So for SL20, you would, might like to know. And, uh, and we would like to know precisely when the Lustig conjecture holds. And so this has been the subject of a lot of work over the last 10 years. And to sum it up, Kajan-Lustig conjecture is, Kajan-Lustig theory is to do with intersection cohomology, which is very manageable in when your coefficients are characteristic zero. When you go into characteristic P, one starts to use these things called parity sheaves. And these lead to new polynomials that depend on P. And these polynomials have a fascinating aspect that if I fix A and B here and let P grow, then I, I return normal Kajan-Lustig polynomials. But for small P, they have very subtle behavior. And with Rish earlier this year, we established a character formula. So this is um, a formula for simple modules in terms of these baby Verma modules, where this P polynomial plays a key role. And I should say that my contribution to the proceedings is entirely about this slide. So there's much more detail there. And it's based, the argument with Simon is rather short, and it's based on very long works of Acharish and also some work with Shotaro Makasumi. And these polynomials are computable. So I want to give you a kind of analogy to what extent these polynomials are computable. So in, if I take an affine Weyl group, I can compute probably millions of kajan lutzig polynomials. They're given by some very simple algorithm. These p polynomials, I can probably calculate about 1,000. So they're much more difficult to calculate. But the, the situations in representation theory where I can use known techniques to, to do calculations, I can probably do about 20 or so calculations. And so we can use these p polynomials to go much further in calculations. And already we've been able to settle some questions about groups like SL5, SL6 that have been open for some time. Uh, so I want to finish with a very concrete application of this subject of p polynomials, which is this recent billiards conjecture. So in, uh, it's, it's a shocking fact that in, we don't know the simple representations of the symmetric group in characteristic p. And this is an incredibly difficult problem. And we approach this problem by taking a representation in characteristic zero. We can realize it by some integral matrices. And we can reduce modulo p. And so we get some representation in characteristic p. And you can think about this as somewhat analogous to a Verma module. And so we would like to decompose it into its irreducible consist constituents. And so this is this basic problem. And this problem is enormously open. So it's known when my partition indexing my simple representation has one or two rows. And some people have worked rather hard on this problem. And they, there's isolated cases where people know what's going on. But it's a very difficult problem. And so I was able to run, a, run some programs for about 10 months computing these p polynomials. And then with uh, Lustig, we stared at this data for about a year. So it's, you have some enormous amount of data, and it's very difficult to process. Uh, and we came up with a conjecture, and I find it remarkable. So I'll show you a, a video in a second. Uh, so what it suggests is that these decomposition numbers are given by some kind of discrete dynamical system. I find it remarkable because you can almost uh, not imagine a more discrete problem as symmetric group representations in characteristic P. And what you'll see in this video is there's a one parameter family of modules that we're decomposing. So we go from three row partitions to a question about SL3. So a, a very difficult question about SL3. And there's uh, certain modules for SL3 that depend on a single parameter. And this parameter in these slide in, the, in this movie, I will be presenting as time. And so what you're seeing at a given time slice is how a particular module is decomposing. Okay. So um, can you play the video now, please? Okay. So 
what you're seeing, so if you just freeze time, what you're seeing is the decom decomposition behavior of a module. And you can see that what appears to, you can see what appears to be some kind of uh, dynamical system appearing. And we have no idea why this should be the case. So uh, I hope I've been able to present some very interesting progress in the last 30 years in representation theory, and I hope that there's a lot more to come, and thank you very much for listening. Beautiful lecture. Thank you so much. Well, as you know, there is no time for questions, but let's thank the speaker one more time. Wonderful. Thank you.